pharmacology for the heart part two is going to deal with antiarrhythmics. And your objectives for this unit are to list four, four classes of antiarrhythmic medications. And you should be able to list three common adverse effects of each of those four classes of antiarrhythmic drugs. Quick review back um, to what we talked about. An arrhythmia is basically an abnormal cardiac rhythm. A without rhythmia rhythm. Abnormal cardiac rhythm. And you can see on here is a, a picture of a variety of different abnormal rhythms um, from probably symptomatic severity, the least severe up to the most, with the very first rhythm being the normal one that we would expect to see in cardiac conductivity. So when we're talking about antiarrhythmics, we are talking about medications that will now attempt to correct rhythms to be as close to possible as normal so that we get the ideal cardiac function from a patient. So first we're going to take a look at, makes sense, class 1 antiarrhythmics. And if you gathered this from your read, reading, the category of class 1 antiarrhythmics have a very common feature. All of them are lo also known as local anesthetics. So every one of these medications, when given topically, provide anesthesia to the area. So the common feature of all class 1 antiarrhythmics are that they are also local anesthetics. How do they work? What's their mechanism of action? Class 1s are sodium channel blockers. What they do is they block the influx of sodium into the cells. As we know, sodium is required to create that electrical charge within the cell. So if we block sodium from going into the cell, the cell cannot be electrically charged and therefore it cannot contract. So they work by blocking as a sodium channel blocker, blocking sodium from coming into the cells. Five of the common side effects of antiarrhythmics um, that you may have come across or should have come across in your drug summaries would be that of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, the three biggies, and then anorexia, meaning loss of appetite, and we may also see some rashes coming on people who are taking these medications. In your drug summary, um, you had one of these class 1 antiarrhythmics. And if you recall, that was norpace. So norpace is an antiarrhythmic, falls under the category of a class 1, blocks sodium and works as a local anesthetic. Some of the other ones um, that you may commonly hear, lidocaine, and you may have heard that commonly as a local anesthetic, um, quinidine, and procanamide. Those are a couple of other class 1 antiarrhythmics that we see a lot um, in use today. Naturally, our second class would be class 2 antiarrhythmics. And class 2 antiarrhythmics go by a, a common name, and they are called beta blockers. The reason they're called beta blockers is because they block the effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Again, recalling epinephrine and norepinephrine 
are involved in that sympathetic, parasympathetic response of the body. So they block the effects of that epinephrine. And so as a result, they slow down conduction in the heart and therefore will slow down the heart rate. So they're very good at being used for an antiarrhythmia that has a rapid type of a heart rate going on with it. Um, so working on that fight or flight response, slowing it down. Common side effects of the class twos, if you think about it, we're taking and that we're slowing down that, that fight or flight response. So anything that's gonna slow that down is gonna affect that entire system of the body. So as a result, some of the common side effects you can see are hypotension. It'll decrease the blood pressure. Bradycardia, it slows the heart rate down. And then there's always rashes that can come along with these type of medications too. But if you think again through the physiology of how these medications work, we're now pulling back on that availability of raising your blood pressure and picking up your heart rate when you need to defend yourself in that flight or flight response. So as a result, hypotension, decreased blood pressure, and a slow heart rate. The other effect that also our sympathetic nervous system deals with is our sympathetic nervous system will cause our bronchioles to dilate. It causes them to open up. So in that fight or flight response, we can get more oxygen into the muscles so that we can run like crazy. As a result, if we block that, and these medications can cause bronchoconstriction. Because we're blocking that sympathetic response, now the bronchioles can get tighter, they can constrict. Therefore, it becomes a concern with asthmatics to use this medication. We will avoid, if at all possible, class two antiarrhythmics with someone who has asthma because now we are risking them having bronchoconstriction and, the, and having difficulty breathing as a result of this medication. One, you had a class two on your list or a beta blocker on your list and that was Indorol. So Indorol is a class two antiarrhythmic or beta blocker. Um, another one that we commonly see is called Brevi-Block, B-R-E-V-I-B-L-O-C, Brevi-Block. And that's another common class two um, beta blocker that we use for arrhythmias. Next comes our class three antiarrhythmics. I bet you can guess what's coming after this. Um, our class three antiarrhythmics um, work with potassium. And they work by interfering with potassium being able to leave the cells. As a result, they are called potassium channel blockers. Okay, so they prevent potassium from leaving the cells. Uh, again, we're talking about that sodium potassium exchange, which goes and um, interferes with the contractibility of cells. Next question on here is what is the cardiac cycle? Just a, just a reminder, you need to keep in mind throughout all this that the cardiac cycle is that electrical conduction through the cell through one complete cycle of contraction in the heart. So it's the beginning of one complete contraction to the beginning of next is a complete cardiac cycle. And the class three antiarrhythmics work in a specific area of the cardiac cycle. And that's the actual refractory period. 
So what they do is they prolong that refractory period. By blocking the calcium exit from the cells, the refractory period is lengthened and therefore the heart cannot contract for a little extended period of time. So that's where they actually work on that specific area of that cardiac cycle in the refractory period. Common side effects, nausea, diarrhea, and you may also see hypotension with these. Again, we're interfering with the contraction of the cells, which may cause some blood pressure drop. And three, two, uh, sorry, two, um, some examples of class three medications. Beta PACE is one, B-E-T-A-P-A-C-E -E, that you may see. Um, Bretolol, B-R-E-T-Y-L-O-L. And uh, Cordarone, C-O-R-D-A-R-O-N-E, I actually gave you three examples there, are some class three antiarrhythmics. Okay, and as we guessed before, <laughs> class four is the fourth class of antiarrhythmics, commonly known as calcium channel blockers. So they are working by decreasing the influx of calcium into the cells. By decreasing that in influx of calcium, the amount of calcium comes into the cells, they become less excitable and again slow down the contractility of the heart. So that's why these are often referred to as calcium channel blockers. Common side effects of these are headache and dizziness. And one other one that often comes around along with when we mess with calcium in the body, and that's constipation. And you're going to hear that later on in some other things when we're talking about calcium. Um, so constipation can be uh, another biggie with the class 4 um, calcium channel blockers. Do you recall from your drug summaries which one was a class 4? Cardizem. So Cardizem was a class 4. It is a calcium channel blocker. Now, we need to keep in mind um, this last piece becomes very important. What other heart disorder might be contradictory to class 4s? Now you need to think about what the class 4s are doing. And we said the class 4s are decreasing the contractility of the heart. What disorder do we not want to make the contractility less in? Chronic heart failure, CHF. We actually need strong contractility in CHF. So if someone has chronic heart failure and they have an arrhythmia, this would not be a drug that we would give them to treat their um, arrhythmia. We would pick one of the other classes of medications because the last thing we are because what we're going to do is we're going to end up competing against the medication that we're giving the cardiac glycoside that we're giving to make the heart beat stronger, more contractility, and then we're going to give them this medication which is going to cause less contractility, and we're going to end up negating the whole process. This comes right out of your textbook, and this is a nice little summary of the antiarrhythmics. So if you have if you have a minute or so and can take and look over this, this will help you. May help lay things out in table format if you're that type of a linear kind of a person. Um, discussing the calcium channel blockers, potassium channel blockers, the beta blockers, and our sodium channel blockers. Uh, and what you will see is 1A, 1B, and 1C. A, B, and C are just subcategories of class 1. And then 2, 3, and 4 
with also some drug examples on the side. So this is a good reference to go back to um, when you want, if you want to do some review on your antiarrhythmics medications. So concluding this unit, um, you should now have an idea of what the four classifications of antiarrhythmics are, what their mechanism of action is, some common side effects, and some of the common medications that we give that or fall under each of the four categories.